Hey, hey. Hi. Give me one How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. It's been a crazy busy day. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to just winding down, having a good chat and heading to bed pretty soon. So, yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a good day, but a really, really busy one. Um, oh, I'm really introverted. So and so, yeah, well, I, I'm used to the time. Like, I, I'm massively used to, like, um, staying up really late because I just work with so many people in America. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm introverted. And for some reason, I thought, you know what? I'm going to have an easier week and batch all my conversations in, like, 36-hour window. <laughs> um, and so you are my last conversation I have booked in this week. And so I'm really excited. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, first of all, I totally feel you. I am also very introverted and I experiment every now and then with like batching and spreading yeah. about. I can't decide which is better for my recharging abilities. Like, is it better to right. just like pack them all in one swoop or is it better to like space them every other day if possible? <laughs> mm -hmm. so, and it feels like uh, if you, there's different variables at play where sometimes you're like, oh, batching is the best. I love that. It works so well. And then you do it again another time and you're like, I I will die in the next hour or so, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm actually doing really well with it. I, I, I've actually had a great few days. Um, but yeah, I think it was more, I don't know if you ever could kind of get more overwhelmed by the thought of things than actually the things themselves. And I think I've got myself into a headspace where I'm like, oh God, this is going to be really hard. And it actually hasn't been hard at all. Um, and that sums up my life big time. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you by chance an INFJ? Is I that am an INFJ, type? yeah. Okay. That's exactly what I am. It's been so long since I've thought of myers -Briggs. So we're very similar, but yeah. Oh, do you know what? No, sorry. I am an INTJ. My wife is an INFJ. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> my boyfriend um, is also an INTJ, but he like straddles the FT. So it's okay. quite a nice pairing, I think. I like it. <laughs> Mm. It's it's a good combo, I think, on the whole. Um, yeah. A lot of my it's funny because they say INFJ is the least um, common, which I don't believe because like about fifty percent of my friends are INFJs, and I'm like, where the hell are you people coming from? Like you're the like least common. It's like two percent or something like that. They say, and I'm like, uh, maybe I've got like some sort of magnet for INFJs that like they're just drawn to me. But uh, I, I you're one of the first I INTJs I've been I've met really. I, I, I've oh, really? done many people that are similar to me. So, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, they, they are, they are pretty rare. I do find though that like INFJs especially tend to draw other like INFJs and INTJs specifically, like, like most of my That's best weird. friends are INFJs. <laughs> so and funny. I, yeah. There's like a, a sensitivity to obviously the introversion and also like orderly, reliable, dependable that like makes us mm -hmm. feel really assured with one another. And then, you know, obviously like abstract thinking and like analyzing and feeling like it's all yes. endlessly good fun. So I think. Yeah, find absolutely. It. Yeah. It's so funny. I, I, I definitely need people in my life like big time. I'm very introverted. I think we mentioned this last time we talked to like the, the combo of like wanting to be around people, like the draw of even church and things and going, oh, I want to be part of something, a community. Um, but I really like being on my own. And what I found is actually, I love being around certain people. And yeah. actually going into a church, generally speaking, is not the way to find that group of people. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's very carefully curating the people that you meet and going, oh, you, you you're going to be a good friend. You, let's talk another time goodbye uh, you know like finding my uh my people has been like really really slow going but now i'm like oh i could be with these people for hours and hours and hours on end and it doesn't drain yeah. me but i think that that type of person infj intj they're so well intjs i think are just quite selfish and just want what they want i think the infj is more aware of what the intj wants <laughs> i don't because i don't think i'm that sensitive to what other people want <laughs> actually <laughs> No, I know what you mean. I, I'm aware of it. It's on my radar, but I care about me more. <laughs> so it's how it like filters for me. It's like, I'd like to think that I genuinely care more about putting others before self. And it's like, I've just burned myself out the hard way as I'm sure, yeah. you know, too. It's like, mm -hmm. this is good for no one if I don't yeah. like put certain things about myself first. So yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of that is my reaction. I'm reading your story and I'm like, oh my God, like, how have I lived the same life? As, uh, and I was kicking myself the whole time I'm reading your book. I'm like, I am the worst interviewer ever. I'm like, I talked to you for two hours and we didn't talk about this or that. I'm like, <laughs> how did that not come up? Um, 
because we, oh. we have had very similar, you know, um, backgrounds, you know, my, my, yeah. my dad was a pastor and we maybe had a little bit more stability, but I was counting today and I'm like, we had been in eight homes by the time I was 16. And we've been a part of seven different churches as, as my dad being the pastor by the time I was 16. Wow. And it was just nonstop. And you were constantly giving up of yourself and all that different stuff. And I think a lot of my um, default um, desire to please people and take care of people and, and and go no 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 not no it doesn't matter what I want what do you want how do I focus on you or whatever most of it is probably some bizarre holdover from trauma because when I actually dig deep I'm like that is not my default I'm not very good at it and I'm always burning myself out when I step into that stuff every time I have to act out of a more stable place for any of that to be healthy um, Do you find that yeah. for you, it's almost like a deflective thing? Like when you're focused on other people, it deflects invasiveness about yourself. All right. Hold on, Alice. You're getting a bit okay. close to the bone. Back off. <laughs> I don't I don't need you accurately depicting my flaws. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Well, the only reason but I like, say it's because... Seriously, right? <laughs> Guilty here. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I'm joking. I'm joking. But like, dang, like on the button, right? Uh, and it's it's so fascinating. I was talking to... Um, I had some friends around on Sunday and it was so nice because we finally can have friends around in the garden. We're still not even allowed homes. And I mean, we're still trickling out of this whole thing, but we were hanging out and I was talking with them and I was just like, man, it took me so long to realize that both my parents, I think basically because they were burning out 24 seven being parents of four kids, extraordinarily poor um, full time working in the church, barely getting paid for that. My, my dad would have made more if he went on welfare than the, what he made from the church, but he felt it was like honoring God to take what the church could pay and not going on the welfare. So, so we were like, const I don't even ask, right? I mean, like, <laughs> right? But, but they were just burned out so much that I learned growing up that to love my parents was to give acts of service, to do stuff for them, to clean to bring them a cup of coffee to whatever it was and I, it's only in the last couple of years i've realized that i show my love to everyone in acts of service whether they appreciate it or not whether they want it or not and it's all trickles back to those kind of points in my upbringing where that's basically how i saw my parents love everyone around them and it's how they received love from me um and it's not particularly how I operate. I don't really care that much if people do stuff for me. It's kind of nice, but I don't really care. And yet it's my default every time. Every time I'm like, oh, I'll let me go to the shop and pick something up for you. Let me whatever. And it's so interesting, these kind of holdoffs from like upbringing, how, how those different interactions and experiences shape everything. It's yeah, sure. but I'm constantly discovering, reading your book, I, I'm reading your book. And, and because I think we have such similarities, I'm reading and I'm going, oh my God, you're right. That's why I like this, or that's why I'm like that. It, it was really profound for me in so many ways. And we've had a remarkably different life. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to say that I had the same life writing, but no, just seeing those similarities, I'm like, oh my God, I feel so seen. And I'm processing stuff in ways I hadn't processed before I, and so I've been singing your praises I've been we've got a patreon Aww. group and I've been telling everyone to get your book and I've, I've mentioned it everywhere I go really I've mentioned the last like three podcasts I've recorded oh, um, because it, so it really much. is I, I love reading memoirs I mean we talked about this last time right you mentioned what books you recommended and you listed memoirs you know you're like this 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 um, and I've, I've read them all since but I think there's something about people that have walked your path that have been in your bubbles and you know, YWAM, Toronto, Bethel, you know, Foursquare. I mean, like, I know all this. I know it so well um, that you just read that book and you're like, oh, this is why I am the way I am. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Uh, no, I get those same kind of aha moments talking with, uh, with people like you, like with other people who have also um, it's, it's been interesting, like hearing people's reactions to the book, like putting together things that like, I hadn't even put together about why I am the way that I am. But then of course, in retrospect, it's so obvious. It's like, well, of course, how else was I supposed to turn out? You know, like it's very, right. uh, it's, it's interesting what different lenses people will bring. And, and like you said, we do have so many common threads, like, like, mm. uh, are you the oldest as well? I am. Yeah. You are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> and none of my other siblings were 
anywhere near as intense as me in how they engage with Christianity. Like they're all, you know, have had their faiths and their paths and, and for sure. But like, yeah. I was the intense one for sure. Why do you and think it is? I don't I'm- know. I don't know. It's, I think as a, in my experience, in my family, it felt like I was always trying to please mom and dad. All my siblings were always trying to please me. And I think there was this kind of knock-on effect. Um, and it's probably because I didn't give them the time of day and I was horrible to them 24-7, 365 days of the year. I was mean to my siblings. I was a horrible brother. Um, but I do feel like there was this thing of like, I very much felt this pull to be like my my parents, to, it, it, you know, the pastor's kids. Well, everyone's looking at the oldest pastor's kid. No one looks at the third pastor's kid to see if the pastor's a good father, you know? No, no, no. I want to see the top person, the one that's the oldest. They should have it down the most. They should be the most passionate. And I felt like that on some level. I I needed to live Uh up to that. And I hated it. I resented it. I didn't want to do it. I also was like, not good at it. Right. So the whole time, you know, you, you talk in the book, you know, about like, you know, not falling over and things. And I'm like, I never fell over in my entire life. And I'm like, what is that? Right, because that's not my experience with my siblings, and it's not my experience with my parents. But here I am, the oldest child, and I was thinking that as well. I was like, "Is this an oldest child thing?" I don't mm-hmm. know. It's it's really weird. I definitely think birth order plays can play a significant role in it because for all the reasons you said, like especially if your parents are in leadership positions, there's this mm-hmm. sort of responsibility to. Um, it, I, for me, it was not explicit, but it was very implicit, like a, a responsibility to. Uh, represent to make them not 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 like I, I don't want to say like my parents needed me to make them look good but there is this sort of um, I think children are naturally responsive to what gives them praise and mm. we want more of that and similar to you like I got where you got praised for like acts of service you know like always like looking out and being helpful I would get praised for being um, so responsible so sweet so so uh, obedient and mm. uh, and you know the, the old of, of five. And so it, I, I played into that role. And again, going back to deflecting, I feel like, so, and sorry, but bear with me, tying it a little bit back to Myers-Briggs. So the first time I took the Myers-Briggs test, I was um, 20 years old. I tested as INFP, which is very different than an INTJ. Mm. And a- in retrospect, um, it wasn't until I retook the test when I was age 26 that I was INTJ and have consistently, te- I'm 35 now and it's just consistent. I feel like I was the whole time, but because I played into the role that I felt like God wanted me to do, it made my edges softer. It made me more submissive. Mm. It made me more quiet. It made me more subservient and more um, helpful and also deflective. It, it was like, I, cause I, I didn't, I, I both really wanted someone to ask me how I am and was terrified because then I might have to be truthful. And if I was truthful, it might get me in trouble. It might get my family in trouble. It might get my siblings in trouble. Mm-hmm. And so it was this, um, it was, it, I was able to, uh, and by nature being more introverted and, and female, I feel like I was a natural fit for what I felt like Christianity expected me to be. It, was, it wasn't a difficult role for me to play. It was not true right. to myself, but it wasn't too difficult of a role to play um, in, in many ways because it allowed me to um, hide who I really am in ways that it just wasn't safe to be who I really was. And I feel really bad for people who grow up in that sort of setting who um, happen to be a little bit more the like hard hitters, rebellious types, the ones who, who like um, are not so submissive, are not so quiet. I was a pretty quiet kid. Like I like right. to sit in the back of the room, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful that I wasn't, um, I think it would have been more hard for me had I had my personality type been a little bit, uh, a, a little just a little bit more <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. that makes sense no, absolutely it, it really does and it is interesting um that dynamic i think there's a bit in your your book where you were talking about your journaling and you 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 there's this throwaway line that i was just like holy shit that's that's it right that's it and i i'm trying to remember what it was um you said specifically but i think you said like writing gave me a way to speak without being silenced and yeah. it just floored me this this thought of you know this young girl who can't voice what she wants to say 
You know, she doesn't, you, your, your parents are carting you all over the country and for the best intentions, you know, there's, you know, nothing, um, you know, very honorable given their worldview and whatever. I'm like, wow, they really believe what they believe. Yeah. You know, that's amazing. Um, yeah, absolutely. But this young girl that doesn't really get it, that doesn't really know what's going on, dragged through this all and doesn't really have a voice. And, and there's this other point, you, you have this point, I think it was when you were traveling through California and one person in the entire several months, maybe was it a year you were in California almost? Yeah, yeah. One person asks you, how do you feel about your parents traveling through? And, and it just, it hit me because I guess as a male, and I was much more outspoken, I was a pain in the ass because um, my parents did they my mom especially raised me and said ask questions doubt authority question it constantly and I was like okay and then she was like shit I'm never gonna raise a kid like this again and I think she brought up my other siblings like don't ask so many questions as Phil does sure. um, so I was a pain I know but I, but even the privilege of having a male like or being a male sorry like there's a component where you're expected to ask questions you're expected to challenge and push back and and all of that that in a lot of Christian um, traditions, I know that some Christians are different and raise their kids differently, but a lot of Christian traditions, you are to be silent as a female. You aren't supposed to voice. You are supposed to be obedient and submissive and just go with the flow. Um, and that, like, it just really hit me um, to a whole degree I'd never really engaged with. And I, I talk with women all day, every day online about their experiences, but there was something about that phrase of like, when you were able to write you had you were you were completely free of that control of being silenced of, of i mean mm -hmm. that is intense can you talk a bit about what that was like growing up like you know like tell me tell me because uh, i just can't get my head around the the heartbreak the processing but at the same time the being under the thumb of god's going well alice what do you expect? This is the way God's, you know, the, your parents, God's told us to uproot and leave everything and abandon everything we hold dear and everything you love. And I know you don't understand it, but we don't really care. Um, that's a hard thing to process. Really hard. That, yeah, that is what I internalized. And it was, it was very confusing because, um, uh, similar like to what you just said about how your parents, it sounds like um, a little bit of mixed messaging going on, like it be inquisitive, challenge authority, don't just take someone's word for it. Um, for me, I felt like I was told, and I touched on this a little bit maybe in the book, or maybe it was an earlier draft, so much had to get cut. Um, but it, I was always encouraged, like, share your feelings, like, don't bottle things up, because mm. I bottled things up so much as a kid. And I think I I think I did that um, partly because I came from a big family. So there was, and my my four younger siblings are, I don't think any of them would disagree that they're all louder than I am. <laughs> um, and uh, they, they, uh, I think one of the lines that I used to have in my book was that I felt like a piglet in a family of tiggers um, because I always <laughs> felt like they were always just bouncing around and fun and adventure and ooh this that and could squabble and get over things really quickly. I was like slow to conflict, but once I was there, it was just like, mm. I, I felt it was like I was irretrievable from whatever dark, sad place I went to. Um, so I was told you know, that it wasn't healthy to bottle my emotions because I would grind my teeth incessantly. It was a big problem. Um, and my parents were like, would encourage me to share my feelings, especially my negative feelings. Like if I was sad, if I was angry, if I was hurt about something. But the problem with that, um, through no, not, not necessarily any fault of their own because they didn't know better, um, sure. was, uh, and they were doing the best they could, of course, was that when I would like crack open my heart, which is a scary, was always scary for me to do, to be truthful, mm. even though I would, my, my name, Alice means little truthful one. My parents <laughs> would never hesitate to remind me. Um, but to actually be truthful didn't really feel safe because when I would, um, often the, the, the message that I feel like I would get back the most was, a blank face with a, well, if you don't like it, talk to God about it because we're just following him, especially as I got older. Mm. When I was little, you know, and if it was like squabbly, normal childhood petty things like, oh, this girl wouldn't let me use the blue marker, you know, <laughs> for, for whatever. Um, those were those were easier things and uh, to, to 
for my parents, I think, to sort of help me navigate, like how to stand up for myself. But when it came to standing up for myself and expressing myself in ways that challenged what they believed God wanted us to do, what could they say to me? You know, like I knew they cared about me. My parents always, uh, I never doubted that they loved me, but it did feel like they chose God first in ways that um, make sense to me now. And even made sense to me back then, because Jesus says, you know, in places, the Bible, like, if you don't hate your brother, Mm. your parents and come follow me, like, it's like, you're not doing it right. So of course you're going to be hated. And Jesus kind of commands us to hate there in that weird verse that always confuses. Um, and, uh, and, you know, to like sell everything you have, give it to the poor and only then can you be a true disciple. So to Mm -hmm. me, even though my parents didn't necessarily emphasize these verses, um, they emphasize the other verses that were more like, look at the birds of the air, you know, they don't worry about where their food's going to come from and God takes care of them. My parents emphasize verses like that, where, uh, which for anyone who's listening who doesn't know, um, let us eventually be homeless for a period. The verses that I read on my own, though, that I just put the lens over when I would look at my parents' choices was, whoa, they're taking it seriously. Like Jesus says to sell everything, give to the poor, follow him, like don't care about what your other family members think about it. This is the best way to love him if you're serious about being a disciple of Christ. And so I just thought like, where do I exist if it's all about God? And it should be about God, you know, because like what my entire life's purpose is to serve God. That's the only reason I exist. So it was very confusing to to, um, feel like, to obviously be a human and having feelings, Mm. but feel like there was no place for them or there were, but only conditional feelings at conditional times. And so writing, yeah, it really, I'm I'm glad that line stuck out to you. Um, It really did. Writing really was my way of um, getting to like express myself without, without being silenced, without being interrupted, Mm. without being corrected, without being modified, without being, without fearing shame or fear itself. And so Um, yeah, I've kept a journal regularly since I was about, I, I, I have journals that go all the way back to when I was seven, but I would say I really started oh regularly doing it when I was about 10, 11 years old. But yeah, I have a trunk full of journals. And then when I was 17 onward, now they're digital because I started doing it on my computer. So right. I have like, they're like searchable now. Like <laughs> Yes. I'm not a big fan of clouds. So right. uh, yeah. just for like privacy reasons. <laughs> but yeah, like I have I have so many, I'm still a journaler, although I will say a lot of my journaling time was put to the side as I was writing my book, which is basically mm. kind of like journaling as it's memoir. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I when my wife and I um I think it was right after we got engaged, we went back to her family's ha- home and we were hunting through some stuff because she wanted to find some of her old stuff and um, she found this big box full of journals and they go back from, I think the age of six, I think when she was six in school, they had a weekly assessment, like for our assignment at, at Monday, first thing you came in and you wrote about your weekend. Um, and so she's from then on, she's just kind of like got these like journals and all sorts of stuff. And wow. on the drive back, it was about five hours drive back. And she just literally read journals to me of her childhood. And I was <laughs> honest, it's so funny because it's like, this is the person I know but it's really not. It's also like a six-year-old version of this person I know. I can see the same neuroses. I can see the same fears. I can see the same hopes. Yeah. But also you are telling me about a joke you heard and it makes no sense at all. And you clearly are an absolute idiot, right? Like all six-year-old <laughs> kids are, right? Um, and it's just amazing. Have you have you come across um, Mortified, the movement Mortified? No, Mortified? So, yeah. Oh, you need to jump up. So it's on um, it's on Netflix. It's a podcast called Mortified Nation, I think. And basically it's um, it's these local kind of pop-up events that they do around the, the country, around the world. And what they do is they get people to come in and read passages from their journals, childhood journals or like oh, early young adults fun. or whatever. And it, it's so fun. But the whole process is like, it's almost... Um, going back and and loving your past self and seeing your past self with, you know, with 20 years of life added onto it and such compassion towards your prior self, you know, you go, Oh my gosh, like I went through that. That's how I felt at that time. We forget so much. 
Um, yeah. I don't have journals from my childhood. I, I think my best journal I can find is like maybe like when I was like 24 or something is the earliest I can find. Um, and I'm so envious of people that have it. But I mean, it must have been really healing to you to be working through this process of looking through your childhood and, and evaluating these different points and reflecting on them and how am I going to portray them? How am I going to write about it? How do I see it now? Like, what was it like writing this memoir of your life? I, I can't even imagine. I can't remember last week. Like, I can't remember <laughs> anything. I've got terrible okay. memory. Totally different memory bank. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it was, it was like, it, it was all the things, like all the things you'd expect. It was difficult. It was cathartic. It was funny. It was cringe. It was like so, so many, so many feelings. Um, uh, first and foremost, like I'm really grateful that I journaled because it allowed me mm. a certain degree in writing my memoir. It allowed me a certain degree of um, confidence that I feel like like I try to imagine how other writers who didn't journal write a memoir, like relying solely on memory and maybe like calling up family members or friends and being like, how do you remember this? You know, that's got to be very challenging. So I feel very mm. grateful that I happen to be such a writer from a young age because it allowed me to track like, oh, yes, my family was living here when this happened. And oh, yeah, that girl in youth group said this to me. And oh, yeah, it made me feel this and sent me off on this whole tailspin. And I can totally see why that affects me today. Um, so there were a lot of those a lot of those moments and other times just moments where I would just read it and just like get so emotional just saying like oh poor like 15 year old Alice you know right. just raking herself over the coals over something dumb you know that like really wasn't anything at all but in to my 15 year old self was like the end of the world you know and I'm sure I'm sure anyone mm -hmm. who looks back over their teenage journal can find moments like that for, for <laughs> me most of it was all about God. And like, I had three journals throughout my teens and into my, yeah, throughout my teens into my late teens, like there'd be my poetry journal, my regular journal and my prayer journal. And so between those three, I could really, as I was crafting my book, really have a, a round, a pretty well-rounded picture of where I was at then. Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, of course the, it's, it's, uh, tricky it, because even, um, and I say this at the very beginning in my author's note of my book, memories can change even as they're being formed. So mm -hmm. to that extent, even my journals aren't necessarily a foolproof source, you know, like certain things that I might recollect in my journals might be like someone else involved could remember totally differently. Um, sure. So I can't say that, you know, but that, that, that it's the God's honest truth. Um, the way I don't think any memoirist can about their book, because it's like, it's, it's our truth as to how we remember it to the best mm. of our ability. Um, and that's certainly my, my intention when I, when I wrote it, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it was definitely a trip going back through those, through those journals. And I will say one of the other funny things that I found in the writing process is that once it's, I, I think I read this somewhere that like you're, the way it first comes out on the page or the first time you talk about it is often the most accurate. And I think mm. police detectives know this when they, when they interrogate um, people trying to get information about what might've happened around the crime. Like it's important to interview people like early, early on, because oftentimes their very initial revelation coming out about it will be the most accurate. And uh, I, I feel like I read some writing advice a while saying that that was true about writing. And so it made me want to be very careful with right. drafts and like how I wrote something because I found this to be true. Um, there's been times like, especially post the book's publication where like, I'll think of a scene and because I changed names in the book, I can't even remember the person's real name. And I'll like have to go That's back funny. and look it up like in, in for real life. Like it's it's weird how how putting something down or saying something out, it's like some human instinct to uphold that narrative right. continuously, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's um it is risky to put something down on paper and or or to share it in a podcast, you know, because it's a uh, you know, stories can take lives of their own. And I really yeah. strive for accuracy wherever possible and for cross verification where I could. But, um, but yeah, that was definitely something I had in mind that made me be like, whoo, like, like must tell a story carefully because it's not just me involved. <laughs> it's my family involved. Right. Like, absolutely. Other church people involved. So 
Yeah. yeah. Good question. And, and that's that's got to be. Uh, I mean, I know you, you kind of touched on this dynamic a little bit in the book, in in at the beginning, at the ends, and stuff. But that's a hard dynamic as well. Of, you know, I talk to so many people. I know you talk to so many people that are coming out of kind of these fundamental backgrounds, and that can be a fraught time as far as family relations go and and navigating beliefs and changing beliefs and relationships and how that changes over time i mean sitting down and did, did you sit down and you tell your parents hey i'm gonna write this memoir and obviously you know you're not that old a good chunk of this memoir is hi my parents are with me and on some <laughs> level this shit's a bit weird and you're gonna blame my parents. You're not going to blame the, the, the author, right? You're not going to go, well, Alice is clearly in the wrong all the way through this. We, we look at the responsible adults and go, oh man, this is terrible. This is the worst. This is awful. Um, and, and I have to say, you did a really great job of like humanizing your parents in such a beautiful way, because I think it's so easy when we go through these deconstructions and deconversions to demonize our past, to demonize um, people involved in our past, pastors, you know, Lou Engel, your dad, you know, whoever. Um, it, it's really easy to do that. And I think you did a really great job of humanizing them. But I mean, what does that look like sitting down with your parents and going, hey, I'm going to write a a, a, a memoir and paint the story of this past that you might not be the most excited to be reliving with a few thousand people that are going to read it. Oh man, Phil, honestly, it, it was the hardest part from beginning I to bet. end. And even now, you know, it's the hardest part um, because unlike a lot of other people who publish these sorts of memoirs, um, people like I'm thinking like Megan Phelps Roper of Unfollow or like Tara sure. Lester of Educated. Unlike a lot of these other people who write these sort of um, leaving religion slash dysfunctional family memoirs, that's like a whole subcategory of memoir. Right. Um, I'm still very close to my family. I am not yeah. a stranger to them. My parents are both living, um, which I'm so grateful for, uh, all, all of that. But it does make telling my story a lot uh it's just hard in some ways that I'm, I don't yeah, know if it was hard for them. I, I'm not sure if it would be harder if I was estranged from them or just as hard or easier. I don't know. But uh, mm. so what that, what that conversation looked like, well, first of all, my book started off as a cookbook years back, like about 10 years back, I was writing, I was really into food blogging. And uh, I, I got a couple books on food writing because I love food writing. Mm. And uh, I'm a major foodie. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have a cookbook of regional North American cuisine with little anecdotal stories from my family's travels to accompany them? Like, Which we'll have way, would be so freaking funny. It's like, um, here's these brownies that I had in, you know, like, I don't know, New Orleans. Let me tell yeah. you the time where I got like assaulted by a pastor. Or, you know, like, it's just like, whoa, okay. Like, exactly. perfect combo. <laughs> It'd be a I'd very the shit out of that cookbook. That would be like a cookbook <laughs> I'd tear through. It'd be such a bizarre book, right? Like I kind of wish I did, but it's okay. Um, but that that's oh, how it started man. out. Was like I was gonna have um, you know, like like a a, a main lobster bake, you know, from when my family was in Maine, you know, and I, at the time I failed to call the suicide hotline because I was scared it would be my siblings would be split up if anyone knew about my family's real living situation. And, and then, you know, the time that I, um, that I wanted to attempt suicide and didn't, that was actually the first writing exercise that prompted my book. So I was writing restaurant reviews for this little website and I wanted to get better. And so, like I said, I got a bunch of um, food writing books and We'll come back to my parents in a sec. Um, I haven't forgotten. Good. I live for these like rabbit trails. These are my favorite okay. parts of any podcast. Cool. I have many. Um, so uh, I, the writing exercise was to write about a very, a time that food played a very significant role in your life. It was something like that. And I was like, oh man, for some reason, the first story that came to me was from when I was 13. And I wanted to jump off that cliff at that campground in Michigan my family was staying at because I was so depressed and felt so powerless and helpless and this journey that God had us on was just never going to end and after I failed to jump um, I remember I ran back into the campsite just like crying and I could not be soothed and I didn't want to talk to my parents about it anymore because mm -hmm. I felt like every time I tried it would just I would just meet this wall that was God and his will and what he wanted for us and I remember 
my mom suggested that we go apple picking after that. Like she like soothed me in the car for a while. And then we went apple picking and just got wild apples. And I remember like being nervous to see if there were black bears that were going to be there because it was like hibernation season when the bears mm. store up. So we got apples and made Bisquick apple cobbler over the campfire um, in a Dutch oven. That's how my dad would make it. And so the recipe was going to be campfire apple cobbler. And the story was going to be the time I almost killed myself. <laughs> That's like the perfect combo. It's like, here's something to eat while you weep over my oh, childhood yeah. trauma. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So oh, oh I God. thought like, oh, this will be such a funny book or like the time when my family was in Florida and we had key lime pie, you know, there were all these stories. I thought, oh, this could be such a, a fun little travel food memoir cookbook thing. And um, my I went to a writing workshop at UCLA and the teacher there was like, look, write a cookbook if you want, but I just feel like I need to tell you your recipes are getting in the way of your story because mm. you have a, a, a really important story. It sounds like, and I have so many questions, like why were your parents living this way? Where were you guys going? What, what was going on? Um, and she's like, write a cookbook one day if you want to, but I just want to encourage you. Maybe you have like a straight up memoir. And so I sort of ran with it and didn't tell my parents about it at first. So coming back to my parents, I didn't really tell anyone about it at first. My best friend knew, Brigida, who had invited me to the writing workshop. Um, but I, and I started telling a few friends, but you know, it's one of those, everyone's writing a book, everyone's writing a screenplay, sure. you know, like it's, it's a, uh, we're all, m most of my friends out here, we're all artists. So we're all in various stages of production on something, whether it's a music album or a film, a TV series, whatever. So I think I, even I didn't really take myself that seriously until I had some sizable chunks of writing that just came out. Um, when I, I can't remember exactly when I mentioned to my parents that I was writing my book, but I can very clearly remember the conversation that I had with them when it was time for them to read it. And that happened, I wanna say in spring of 2019 and that was really hard. I mm -hmm. called them on, um, over Skype and I was like, I'm going to start looking for a, a publisher. And I feel like now is the time for you to read the manuscript before it gets sent out to people. So if there's anything you want me to change, I can change it. And I was like all prepared and rehearsed to like present this very calmly and rationally. And as soon as like they, they got, they, they were, their faces are both there. I just was crying. I could hardly say a word. And then my mom starts crying and like, we're all just like crying because they know that they knew this moment was coming. Um, and it's really happening now. And I, you know, I felt really emotional because it's like, I knew this is also their story. And uh, it, it's, it's the hardest part, I think. And I don't think memoirists talk about it enough to satisfy my curiosity. I was wondering like, what was it like for you, you know? And mm -hmm. ultimately, as I say in the book, my parents um, are supportive of me. Like they, they both recognize that this is something that I needed to do for me to live in my truth now, especially in ways that I didn't really get to, um, growing up. And so I do have their support. There were a few minor things that they wanted changed, um, which I was happy to accommodate. Sure. And, uh, cause I think, I think they, we all have our own version of our story. Absolutely. And me telling mine definitely provokes questions about theirs. What's their version? But it's a, you know, I, I told them what I, I told them one time. I was like, look, if you feel like anything's totally like, I feel like I had a harebrained idea, man, every member of my family should write a volume and then we can publish it as an anthology. <laughs> But unfortunately, it seems like I'm the only writer in the family. You're the only that, one that's passionate about that. <laughs> yeah, or, or is like stupid enough to tackle the task of writing a book um, at this point anyway. They're all really great writers, though. Like I, everyone in my mm. family is a really talented writer when they when they want to be. So um, I thought that would be funny. But, it, you know, there's seven of us. That would take a lot of coordinating and time and waiting. So right. I told my story. I do have their support. It was painful. But it's also... Um, they understand why I'm doing it um, yeah. and to not necessarily air the family laundry or talk about them and their parenting. Um, it's really a story about my relationship with God, the God that was yeah. never real to me. 
Um, and they can't help but be a part of it because they were my parents. And it is yeah. because I was born to them that I found myself in churches and in this Christian belief system and I was homeschooled and all, all of that. So I couldn't quite cut them out, you know, but I, I never intended for it to be a dysfunctional family memoir. For me, sure. it was all more, um, slight coming of age memoir, but I call them leaving religion memoirs. As I think I mentioned to you last time, you know, it's this growing, again, a, a sub genre within memoir. Uh, right. And it's huge. Talk, uh, it's huge. Which I'm very excited about because it's definitely one of my oh, favorite yeah. types of books ever. <laughs> like it's so fun yeah. and so fascinating. And yeah, I, I absolutely love it. I remember I was saying to my, my wife, like probably a couple hours ago, she's like, oh, you're looking forward to your podcast. I was like, yeah, yeah. And, and she was asking me about your book because I've been pushing her to read your book, which she hasn't started yet. And I'm a bit disappointed in her, but you know, <laughs> she's busy. Um, but uh, I've just not had anyone actually, because we don't get out, we're still like, kind of very trapped in our home. I don't have anyone to talk to about this, you know, so I want someone else to read the book so I can like, what about this crazy bit or whatever. Um, but I was saying to her, I was like, you know what I'd love to do somehow? I want to like read her parents' story. I literally said that. I was like, I mean, I'd love to have her mom and dad on my podcast and be like, what was your story? Like, because it, it, it's so fascinating what you're saying. I remember you saying at the beginning of the memoir, I was like, oh, this is refreshing. Someone's going to be honest and say, by the way, some of this is going to be totally warped because every memory is warped. Every perspective is our own perspective and it's enmeshed with our emotions and our experience and our backgrounds and our day and everything affects how we then remember that. And then how often we, you know, sit and mull over it. It's changing every time we bring that up in our head and mull over it. And so by the time you get this memoir, it's close to fiction, you know, I mean, who knows? Um, I know mine would just be, I mean, I, I flesh out stories. I make them more fun and interesting. It's just my nature. So I always tell people take anything I say with a pinch of salt. Absolutely. Because I'm going to adapt it to be funny or more interesting. I'll throw in a clown or someone, you know, something yeah. exploding or whatever. So I just could never do a memoir because every memory I've ever had has been just so uh, brutally um, adapted. <laughs> Um, but, but it is, it's so interesting that nature, I think it does speak to how we go through the process of deconstructing and deconversion and, and just how one-sided it all is in a lot of ways, you know, how we re remember that event, how we remember our faith, how we remember, um, our journey, our relationships, how we connected with God. I'm reading your book and it helped me remember what it was like to be that teenager that was passionate as well. Mm -hmm. It, mostly my late teens, my early teens, not so much. I was kind of pretty disconnected and I felt guilty about it and I tried, but I just couldn't. Um, but coming into my late teens, I was so passionate, so excited. And it's hard for me to get into that mindset. Yeah. It's really hard for me now, 20 years later to look back and go, what, what was I thinking as a 16 year old? How did I engage with that? Like what, you know, like it, it's really hard for me to, enter that psychology at on any level um and yet there was something about reading your story and how you felt in that time and going yeah that's right i do remember feeling like that i do remember the the frustration i do remember um standing in lines waiting for someone to lay hands on you and and, and sitting there going god i hope something happens am i gonna gosh, maybe today i'll go backwards and just pretend i don't want to do it every time but you know you gotta throw in maybe one in five i've got to go down or people are going to start thinking i'm not yeah. serious or i'm not real yeah. and believe this or you know all these things mulling through your head and then you're going oh shit i'm overthinking this too much i should be thinking about god and then you're going okay god god i god I'm, i love you i'm i i so want to experience you tonight I, I, i'm sorry i'm overthinking you know the, getting yeah. in your head trying to escape your head then go back into your head and go well now you god's not listening to you he knows that you really are just trying to get in the right thing to get an experience like he's not going to give you an experience if you just want the experience oh my god it's like it's just endless like layer upon layer upon layer and you're just going fuck how do i escape this and the whole time nothing's happening right and you're like yeah. maybe if i just start lying down on the floor maybe if i just like go lie down on the floor somewhere and just lay there someone will think i've had some sort of profound experience you know um and at the very least they'll leave me alone for like a little bit and i can just oh, like pretend to be plain and like have a moment yeah. of quiet where like i don't mm -hmm. have to engage with anyone and be fake 
Yeah. So, and then though, they have the thing of you then get up and it's time to go home and you're in the car. Oh, so what happened? I was like, what did God say to you? You know, what did you, did you get a vision? Did you, what, what, where, where was he touching you? How was he touching you? You're like, Oh fuck. I was actually like daydreaming about like that project I've got for at school or, you know, I was thinking about that guy I like or whatever. <laughs> right. And it's just like, shit. Uh, oh, uh, that God, uh, took me to a waterfall and he said that he's pouring grace over me. And oh my God, that's amazing. And then you're thinking, God, God's going to burn me for in hell forever for lying. And like, it's just endless. And oh. I forgot all about it. I forgot all of that. Like I just put it completely out. My, and then I'm like, no wonder I'm so fucked up. Like, like, no wonder I spent like my entire teenage years being in this neurosis, not even teenage years, probably till I was 24 or so I was still doing this. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I, I mean, I went to Bethel. I spent four years there. I was in services every day for four or five hours. And for a good chunk of those, they were worship services and people were falling over and having these profound experiences. And so I wasn't even doing this like once or twice a week. I was doing this like seven or eight times a week. And God, that's, yeah, I, I'm starting to piece together why I'm such a screwed up mess. Interesting. You know, like, it's just so fascinating, like piecing all that together. It, it's, it's, a, it's lot. a lot. It's a lot. And that's the part that I miss the least is the confusion, the mind, the self mind fuckery of it all, because it's mm -hmm. that, that living in that constant state of neuroses of shame and doubt and shame for feeling doubt and earnestness and like zealous attempts to like commit to try, but the self awareness that you're faking and God can tell, but isn't it God's fault anyway? And that he's not touching me. And then no, oh, mustn't think that must repent, you know, can't be angry at God. And no, but they, this person saying it is okay to be angry at God. Okay, God, I'm pissed. Like I'm doing everything. I'm giving my all. Where are you? Show up. Nothing. Oh, you know, it's probably because there's a sin. Okay. Yeah. Well, mm. there's always a sin, isn't there? There's always oh endless like right i mean it's almost yeah. always one sin of course which is some sort of lust or sex or masturbation or or sex. Or some some sort of sexual thing usually yeah. um but there's always something we can find where we go oh i bet it's that like, that's the beauty of the whole system um and I, I don't think someone sat down and came up with a system that would trap people and force them to stay in it based on guilt it just evolved that way probably but it is a system of you're yeah. always trapped. There's always something that you could point back to and go, well, have you done anything wrong this week? And you're like, shit, this week? I'll try this hour. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. geez. Yeah, it's, 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 and, and I mean, the mind fuck, I, I loved re, re, finding those moments. Um, I had such, um, empathy in those moments you know you talk about things like um you would sit and, and worry that god would make you marry someone you weren't attracted to to teach you about being shallow and caring about being attracted to someone. i have thought that a thousand times like that was my childhood i was like oh my god like i've spent too many hours as a teenage boy watching porn and 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 lusting over the pretty girls in youth group and only caring about looks and God's going to make me marry someone that I'm not attracted to at all to teach me a lesson. And, and, and the kind of warped perspective and, and to the point that that then actually affects you, you know, actually gets to the point where you're in a position. I mean, we talked about this in the last podcast as well. And people hopefully have figured out we're not going to go into your life story in depth and they should go back and listen to that first or buy the freaking book people. Um, but you know, the, the, the situation you had with, um, it, you know, childhood friend moves to town and goes, hi, I'm speeding up the process, but hi, I think you're supposed to, God told me you're going to be my wife. And then your dad going, yeah, I, I, I thought the same. He's probably going to be your husband. And you going, oh, I don't want to be married. But you, you, you said, I think one of the things you kind of said was like, you were like, even, even if I started to believe these things, um might not be true and start going down that avenue i'd still go well it's probably the devil trying to deceive me you know it's it, the yeah. level of barriers you have to climb through before you can come out of that neurosis it's it's unbelievable no it's 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 like self mind control it's mind control mm. I, I refer to it as self gaslighting um yeah. because we know in our gut i knew in my gut i always knew god wasn't speaking to me it wasn't because I was doing anything wrong. I knew that. And anything I was doing wrong, I sincerely repented for. And God had to know that. But I had to gaslight myself because I had to make it make sense why he wasn't touching me or speaking to me ever. And that, you know, I've been I've been studying um, 
secular cults a little bit lately, uh, just as another little rabbit trail side, side note. And um, what stands out to me are like all of these terms that we use for how um, cultic leaders operate, you know, the, they, they exercise mind control, they, they love bomb, they manipulate and guilt trip, you know, they gaslight and make you doubt yourself. I did that to myself. I was my mm. own in many ways because um, it'd be easy for someone to blame it on the church I grew up in, but I grew up in many different churches. It'd be right. easy for someone to blame it on, you know, just my parents. My parents did not talk to me this way. I talked to them this way. I write in my book. My mom apparently didn't even believe in hell. Right. I was always focused <laughs> on the love and faithfulness of God. And I was the one who was like, or else. Like I was focusing on the right. or else because it was terrifying. Like these wishy-washy parents oh. are even doing it seriously. Come on, get get your group get grip together, guys. You know, you don't take it seriously. <laughs> Fine print. This is <laughs> this is high stakes here. You know? I laughed so hard at, at one point. You mentioned you know rape in the Bible. You ask your dad like you know would you, would you let you know people rape me if that was what God wanted and and your mom's so shocked. She's like, "There's rape in the Bible," and I died. I died because I was like, "Like, are you kidding?" Like. 7% of the Bible is rape. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just like horrific, like just how much there is. Yeah. 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 It's, no, it's wild. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but. No, uh. no. Yeah, that, it's moments like that. Like, are, are, that's like a perfect example of, you know, the, how, what I picked up from the Bible and what my parents mm. Up, you know, and again, like I'm looking at what Jesus says we have to give up, and they're looking at how God's gonna provide what He's gonna bring too. And I think that that's just, um, I don't know, one could argue it's like optimist, pessimist, or whatever. I, I don't know. All I know is like I was so focused on getting it right, making sure that I understood the Bible the way I was supposed to, what was the right way to interpret this verse, what was the right way to be the best Christian that I could possibly be, because the stakes were so high. It wasn't because. Yeah. I loved God. I said I loved God and I did, but I loved this idea of God because he wasn't real to me. And so I couldn't, I be, I never did feel God's love. So I didn't have that incentive like my parents did and other people like them who did feel some sort of connection to what they called God, which other people might call the divine or the universe or, you know, something, something. I never felt that. And so there was never those positive, there were never positive incentives for me to go along with the Christian program. There were only the fear-based incentives. Not that those were any more real to me. Like I didn't see Satan or anything like that, but I could, re I, they, the, 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 the consequences were just so high that they made such an impression. Um, and the, the imagery that I had of hell and of spiritual warfare and the demonic realm, those were so vivid and terrifying in my mind that they really did govern like so, so many of my decision-making. Like I could relate to feelings of fear and shame. I couldn't relate to feelings of like oneness or absolution of feeling forgiven you know it's like I didn't I, I didn't relate to the more positive things and anything I did was very easily connected to like I feel good now because you know my aunt gave me a special coat you know or like it was always connected to the humanity I saw the humanity and all of the goodness and I didn't really see that much evil in humanity and I you know I say that coming from a very lucky position in life. You know, I didn't have to go through, I went through, you know, what I went through, but I didn't have to go through a lot of what other people suffered. And uh, I think, I don't know, like, I'm not sure why my brain latched onto the parts of the Bible that it did and the, my motives that it did, but that's just how it was. It's just how I'm wired. And uh, yeah. it was easier for me to fear God than to love him because fear I don't know. It just felt realer. Is I guess all I can say. <laughs> mm. Well, it's it's one hell of a motivator, right? I mean, when you look at, um, I don't know if you've looked at like stages of um, uh, moral development, like Colbert or anything like that. But like mm. when, so as as you grow up, as you develop, as you mature, the motivators for your morality evolve, and mm. the earliest motivator, earliest before anything, is fear of punishment. I do what's right because I'm scared. Um, and as you grow up, I do what's right to be rewarded. 
And then as you grow, I do what's right because it's part of our culture and it's our rules and it's our, you know, and it's, we agree that this is a good thing. And, and as you keep going, one of the latest stages is I do what's right because I believe it's right. It, it's, it's just, I want to do what's right. And I am my own authority on figuring out what's right. And I believe that on some level, there's probably some universal things that are probably right. And I'm going to figure it out and, and live that way. And, and what's really interesting is how many people, I don't know if you've heard this. I guarantee you've heard this. As soon as I said it, I'm like, you've heard this. How many people say, well, you know, if there is no God, well, how will you do what's right or wrong? Or if there's no heaven or hell, well, like, why would anyone, you know, not just sin and, and things like that? And, and, it, and it betrays that their level of moral development is like zero. It's, it's just at the ground floor. Their level of moral development is I am scared and I don't want to be punished. I don't want to go to hell. Or maybe it's become as evolved as, well, I want to go to heaven and I want to get rewarded by God for doing the right thing. But beyond that, there's not much more. They haven't moved beyond that. And that's not to um, put them down or say, and it's just to say that's, that's where people are. That, that's the stage yeah. of development. You, you don't mock a three-year-old for being three. You know, you don't mock a 10-year-old for being 10. It's just the age they're at. And I think... Um, it highlights, though, for so many of us growing up in the church, that was that was the playing field. There wasn't really a space to grow beyond that. Maybe some people lived in a place where it was like, oh, no, well, we do what's right so we can be rewarded and so we can experience the goodness of God and the love of God. And maybe a lot of the charismatic church actually maybe did that better than a lot of places in, in some ways. Um, yeah. But a lot of us didn't get it. A lot yeah. of us did not get that. I, I mean, I know for me, like, it was endless my entire relationship with god i've said this a hundred times on the podcast but probably from the age of 14 to about 24 i do not think i thought of god or had any interaction with god however i framed that at the time without framing it and putting it through the concept of did i masturbate recently have i watched porn have i lusted after a woman and I'm not particularly that sexually wired. I'm, I'm quite asexual in a lot of ways. Like I, on the spectrum, I am not like high libido wanting to have sex all the time. And still that dominated my entire narrative because I was so aware that this is wrong. This is you, the one thing, you know, you go to youth group and every week the guys and the girls split up into different groups and we get a talk and it's like, hey guys, have you, have you stumbled this week? Have you sinned? Like, and everyone's telling their story about how they screwed up. Like, what other story am I supposed to get here and yeah. internalize? Then this is a big deal to God, and you really don't want to fuck up here. And the yeah. hard part is, you go, gosh, people are saying, oh, I, I stumbled this week. I watched porn. I'm like, dude, this week I've watched porn 23 times today. I'm a 15 year old. You know, like, do you have any idea how much testosterone I've got going in me? And none of us talking about the fact that the youth pastor probably watching and going, I am such a fraud. I watch porn all the time, or, or I'm masturbating nonstop, or lusting, or because again, the youth pastor is probably like 20, right? <laughs> like he's still also just a hormone machine. Um, and and it, even without young hormones, it's you know it's it's part of natural evolution to fulfill your sexual desires. And and I, I think I remember when you you talk about your first awakening of sexuality, you talk about um, this fear and this guilt of like crucifying Jesus over and over again. Um, I think you, you literally use it, was it the phrase like you like I, I crucified Jesus over and over again with every climax or something. It's a beautiful sentence. Um, but I was like, oh my god, I literally have thought that every time like literally i remember like crying probably largely to do with endorphin releases and things like that but you, you you orgasm and you're literally going god i am such a disappointment I'm, I'm so sorry i'm jesus i can't believe i crucified you again and then like an hour later teenage me is back at it and i'm like what is this cycle and and you think the trauma that inflicts um, and no wonder you talk to so many um, people in Christian relationships that have huge problems sexually, having any form of he healthy sexual relationship with their partners because they've associated trauma with orgasm. Like, no wonder, right? No wonder that's a weird dynamic. No wonder there's problems going on there. Um, it's such a huge, huge uh, thing. I don't know, I just rambled there, but please take over and ramble for a while yourself if you saw anything to ramble about there. I, I so relate to what you're saying. Um, I, I and it's easy too to um, that compulsiveness to, especially when you're a horny teenager, to keep like masturbating again and again. It's easy to think maybe it is a demon. Maybe I am obsessed mm -hmm. because I don't yeah. really want to be doing this because it just pleases God, but I can't help it. Oh, I know I shouldn't, but I'm doing it. Oh, and then, you know, it feels good. And then as soon as the orgasm like tapers down, there's the tears again. There's the shame again. And it's just this vicious cycle. And it's, it's like, 
it's terrible. And yeah, no wonder we're so messed up in real life, in the, in the real world, you know, like with mm. real, real sexual encounters. Like I, it's interesting hearing you talk about, um, it's always interesting to me hearing, hearing, uh, men and people who are brought up as men talk about what their experience was like in, mm. in, when, you know, the boys would go off and the girls would go off in like accountability groups and where you guys had the question, like, did I stumble this week? I feel like for girls, it was, uh, it's like we were the stumbling block not did you trip over a stumbling yeah. block where were you the stumbling block who did you make stumble this week mm. and how you know did your spaghetti strap fall did your you know were you like laying down reclining at the church picnic you know in a subject where were your hips lifted in a suggestive way that someone could have seen and like stuff that you're you know you're still like half kid you're not even thinking right. about but you're both sex obsessed and sex ignorant too. Like at the same mm -hmm. time in early adolescence, most, most people I would wager, I certainly was. And so it was like, so I don't know. It's, it's interesting to me always hearing how purity culture affects men, because I feel like it's um, not as quantifiable in some ways uh, mm -hmm. as we can track it's how it's affected women. Um, vaginismus is a, is a perfect example. Yeah. You know, some women, um, their bodies just lock down and they cannot have sex or it's extremely painful and sometimes requires surgery to move past, you know, like I, there's not as much data on how many men suffer erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation or, um, you know, whatever else men struggle with because of purity culture, there's not as much data. And I think a lot of that too is maybe because, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe men don't want to talk about it as, as much as women talk about it. I don't know, the, the female reproductive system is so complex uh, that maybe we just can't help but talk about it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but what, what would yeah. your guess be on that? You're, you're a dude who grew up in the Christian world. Do I don't know. Data on how purity culture has affected men as there is women. I, I've not seen data. I mean, I've had conversations and, and you know, it's it's fascinating to me the different outcomes of these different conversations that people were having as teenagers and the yeah. youth, youth leaders. Because, you know, even simple things like, you know, you're being told you're a stumbling block, but you know that what the guys are talking about in the other room, right? On some level, you know, they're talking about them stumbling, them falling into sin and masturbation and whatever. And what you're getting communicated to you is, it's obvious. They're obviously going to struggle with masturbation. Why am I not having that conversation as a woman? Oh, it's not even supposed to be a thing for me. And then you go, well, shit, I masturbate. And I'm not even, it's not even supposed to, like, I'm a whole other, I'm not even as bad as the, I'm worse than the guys. Because at least they get a conversation about, well, have you done it? And maybe we should yeah. talk about tools. And they aren't even thinking the girls do this. And you're not talking yeah. with the other girls. You're not going, hey, girls, how often do you masturbate? That's not yeah. happening. Um, and so there's this even more repressed shame around things like masturbation, exploring your body, understanding what you like. Um, but yeah. I do think with guys, I mean, of course, like the there's so much going on there that is bound to impact things like erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation and every end of the spectrum and everything that might be in between that could go wrong. I have no doubt. I, I reckon if, I, I know that the, the data for vaginismus is, is, is incredible when you look at it and how it correlates with religion. Like, yeah. I, I mean, the, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but they are really high. Like, really yeah. really high like if you've got that you're really likely to have been brought up in some form of religious culture that's a really concerning thing that we should be pointing at and screaming about you know that should be something that the churches are aware of and know of and, and are talking about and youth groups are, are going okay how do we sit down with our young girls and talk about this how do we sit down with young guys and talk about this and go hey you know how you're learning sex from porn because we don't talk about sex properly well just to throw this in the mix it's probably not going to be like that with a bunch of the girls if you marry any of the ones from our youth group because half of them are in major trauma and can't even have sex right now because it's too painful, yeah. <laughs> right? So have fun with both sides of that equation where we fucked up the males and the females. And it's yeah. it's terrifying to see. It's, it's really sad. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I really was struck by you talking about, you know, um, you get in your periods and, um, I, I laughed, 
I, I'm so sorry I left, but about your whole period, no pun intended, periods, um, but, you know, just understanding and discovering feminine hygiene products and, and what are tampons, what are pads and, and things like that. I mean, it, it, and, and the, one of the reasons is because I know someone, a, a good friend of mine who talks about when she first got her period, she would hide, she, she didn't even use pads and she would hide her underwear because she was so embarrassed and she didn't want anyone to know. And, and, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I, my heart breaks like hearing stories like that but it was because they just didn't get education around this you know like mm -hmm. there's so many people um i'm always struck especially when i go somewhere like america where i'm like this is a very developed country and yet the level of education around women's reproductive systems sexual health is so bad um yeah. And I was just, I, I, I loved your vulnerability and sharing that story and talking about that. But I think that's a huge, I mean, just that speaks just how much we're not talking about this. I know I've talked with, with uh, women in America and I've said like, who taught you this stuff? And if school isn't teaching you, um, did your parents? Well, that's probably who it fell to, but they didn't teach us. And I'm like, okay, so like church, I'm like, probably not. And they're like, nope. And it's like, what did you do? Like, you know, just read the back of the box of every kind of tampon and pad in the store and, and just weeping as a young child going, which one do I pick? I mean, I can't even imagine how scary and uncertain and hard that process is. And yet it seems to be really common in religious circles. Again, religion more so than other things. Yeah, no, it's really, it's, it's really sad how ill-equipped girls are going into puberty um and i you know I'll, I'll focus on girls because like i know it's hard for boys too but they don't have to like bleed and have everyone know there is a <laughs> great and like it, it, i no one enjoys puberty in a lot of ways and maybe there's other reasons yeah. you enjoy it but there is a lot of reasons to be thankful to be a guy going through puberty yeah. like a like, lot we're, of reasons we're also really bad for guys or like learning to control like erections that just come up in public like I, that seems like that sure. that was awful. pretty grim actually now, now thanks for reminding me of that like that was terrible actually <laughs> like, I, feel for, I feel for males in that sense but for 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 girls you know there's like it's also just very physically uncomfortable and painful like my Horrific. mom had cramps and so i didn't even know about cramps like i and i got them really wow. bad as i read about in my book and um, that's what prompted me to finally admit to my mom that I got my period. I didn't want to tell anyone. I was mortified. And I both knew that, you know, this is natural. There's nothing to be ashamed of. But there was so much shame around anything reproductive or sexual in general. How could it not have bled, o bled over, no pun intended, to to when I got my period? You know, like it was, yeah. um, it's hard. Like there, there's, there. I was given a, a Christian sex ed book. And that was about it, you know, between that and like conversations yeah. with friends of mine, like my friend Danica in the book who told me what sex was, um, she told me and she told me an accurate depiction of sex because she'd had sex ed at her public right. school, or maybe it was a Christian school, but either way, she'd had some basic uh, understanding of what sex was. And when she told me, I was just like flabbergasted, didn't believe her, could not believe that my parents would have ever done anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Would, you know it's like right to be fair i think that's a very normal reaction for all yeah. children ever that are like wait what no. no that's they have never done that don't you dare yeah. put that on my parents yeah so there's definitely that that reaction but yeah i think it's um you know and, and kind of going back to what you said too about how girls are not asked how many times they masturbated in a week or a day like they, i i felt like I additionally felt like there was something wrong with me because I did have a very high sex drive. And uh, I think a lot of women do. And yeah. um, I, but it's not talked about. We're, there's so much emphasis on us saying no to sex, saying no to the advances, making sure we don't invite that attention. There was very little, in my experience, zero conversation about what to do when we had sexual desire. There was a lot mm. of talk about romantic desire for when we were told like, you know, in the Song of Solomon, there's that quote, like, don't stir love um, until it awakens, uh, some, something like that. There's different versions of the Bible that, that word a little differently. But basically, there was a lot of emphasis on not building up premature romantic feelings and romantic relationships. Mm. And like, uh, not a sexual way, but just a romantic way. Like, don't don't idolize a crush and fantasize that he's your future husband where you're putting him before God. I like rarely did that. For me, it was more like 
like, like I'm just checking guys out. I'm like lusting after their biceps and oh my God, a man in a thin white t-shirt is just like, oh, I'm like feeling so like, like lust crazy. And we're not talking about that at all. And so there must be something like really the matter with me. If like mm. clearly all these other girls, like they're having daydreams about wedding days and I did too, but it was also like, I'm daydreaming about a lot of other stuff and right. no one's- You're daydreaming about wedding nights, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And and so it was like, it was like female sexual desire might as well have not existed. You know, like there was romantic desire that we were to keep in check because we couldn't make an idol out of our crush. It was yeah. like, had to be Jesus first, you know? It's just like a very weird, I don't know. There, there's so much weirdness going on with a all of it. A lot of weirdness with that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and like even Christian worship songs, like they're very lustful, dare I say. Like especially vineyard worship music. Um, I was ju I just finished recording my audio book recently. And my friend Misha, who's producing it, he didn't grow up Christian at all. Like he's he, Church of England. He's British. But so okay. like loosely familiar with like, you know, the general... English type of Christianity, not not the kind that is right. rampant in like an evangelical sense. Um, yeah, he didn't have tape on the floor for falling no. <laughs> back appropriately. No, no, no. no, no. Uh, what do they call it? Like um, dignity cloths or whatever, where they would modesty dignity. cloths. Where they put yes, yes. So if your skirt rode up while you yes. were crashing on the floor from the spirit, Absolutely. you were crashing the whole church. <laughs> um, yeah. No, so he, when I was recording the part of my audiobook where I'm talking about how I talked my parents into letting me keep the Backstreet Boys Millennium album, I argued that they're Christian because they thank God here in their album cover. Um, I, 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 I have this line and there's something about um, how like the, the lyrics to I want it that way in my heart were about God, you know, like God should be my fire and one desire and my way is selfish and sinful. And my friend just starts <laughs> cracking up in the middle of our recording. He's like, what the fuck? Because it was like, I didn't even really realize how funny it was until he's laughing. I'm like, oh yeah. And then I, sh I Googled some, some vineyard worship music so he could see the lyrics. I'm like, oh mm -hmm. no, because they're graphic. They're all about having a wedding night with Jesus and his bridegroom chambers. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, we're talking about, we're singing about sex as a church to Jesus and being the bride of Christ and having, you know, this wedding banquet, like that they talk about in the Bible where we're all going to, and I remember I, I always had so many questions like, wait, but what about the men? Like that would mean they're gay, like for Jesus, like, how are we all the right. bride? Like, do the men become women? No. And my dad would say, you know, metaphorical things like, um, oh no, it's because we collectively make up the body of Christ. I'm like, well, which part am I? Am I the elbow or the toe? I don't want to be the <laughs> Like I just took things so damn literally. But I yeah. couldn't really see, like, I still don't, to be frank, like, what does it mean to be the bride of Christ? How is that not erotic when everywhere in the Bible, brides get fucked? There's such a big deal about being a virgin and being a virgin, mm -hmm. pride, being pure, white as snow, you know, like, there's so many analogies between us as this, like, church virginal bride, like, hot for Jesus, and... I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's so fucking weird, Phil. It's so weird. <laughs> and to try to, as I'm sure you found yourself, to try to explain it to someone who didn't grow up in it. Oh, it's, it's like... so hard. <laughs> it really is. Absolutely. Oh. And it, it's, it's quite, um, it's quite a beautiful thing. It's suddenly, um, it, it can break you out of this kind of like, I don't know, a bubble where you, you are seeing things through a particular lens and you're going, no, it's totally normal for me to sing like, fill me up, God, come all over me or whatever. And you're like, that's normal. Absolutely. And your friends are like, what? Are, who, who are you singing? To? What? Yeah. Are, are you yeah. straight? Yeah. Like, or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's I remember weird. the one worship song i can't remember the title of it but the lyrics were like let me know the kisses of your mouth let me feel your embrace um something 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 even so lord come and i'm reading mm -hmm. this like from a secular standpoint i'm like this is so explicitly pornographic right um, and like is this just my you know am i just tainting these lyrics i don't know i'm pretty sure they're taken from the song of solomon pretty sure that was actually about real sex and not some mm -hmm. metaphor God and the bride of Christ, you know, it was before right. Christ was because that was Old Testament. Right. So it's like, uh -huh. I, I don't know. I, I, I there, what, whatever, whatever the church needs to do to completely desexualize anything. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's so weird because it's there and that repression seeps out in our worship music in so many things. And it's just like, 
God, what do what do people have against sex? Right. It's it is weird that it's such a, a taboo in most religions, in most cultures as as religions and, and different spiritual outlets evolve. Um it does seem to be such a central piece. And I, I don't know, I mean, you could argue that sex is bec- even in a secular sense is a very central, pivotal kind of component in how we orient, how we sell things, how we, you know, whatever. I mean, it's such a huge thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know what that is. Why is it such a core thing to religion? You know, it, it's it's a weird one. Yeah, it is. It is like and I've said before. I think it's because sex is more powerful than God, um, to a degree. Like it's real. We'll give it that. <laughs> um, you can experience <laughs> it with faith required. Um, and I, th- but I think also like uh, that's one of the reasons why after I left Christianity, when I explored other faiths, because I was mm. desperate for something to take that framework, because I just felt like a whirling compass with no. Sure. Nothing. And so I really looked at other religions. They all, with the exception of Taoism, certain Mm. Taoist things had uh, negative views towards sex and like monks who were celibate. Like, why would one need to be celibate to be a monk in any particular? And like, when I say Taoism, a lot of people argue it's a philosophy, not a religion. I don't know, you can say that about anything. Um, Christianity is a relationship with Christ. It's not a religion. Like, I'm so sick of hearing it's not a religion argument. Um, But uh, I found that Taoism uh, spoke at least healthfully about harnessing Mm. sexual energy. You know, I'm like, maybe there's celibate Taoist monks. Honestly, I can't remember. It's been so long since I looked into it. But that was the one religion that I was like, maybe I could be a Taoist. Mm. But... It was way too metaphorical and loop diddy loop for me. I really like. <laughs> you want some literal? Yeah. I, yeah, I'm. I'm like, like same with Zen Buddhism. I, I'm so done with riddles. I fucking hated mm. riddles. Everything that came out of Jesus's mouth was a riddle, and I'm like, really? You're gonna speak to us in parables and tell us that we're gonna go into the lake of fire if we don't get it? Like, it's just so fucked up. I hate Jesus. He's such a douchebag for speaking in riddles. <laughs> and I love him. It's a reason I hate him. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm gonna call this podcast. I hate Jesus. He's such a douchebag. <laughs> I mean, really, like, since since I'm going there, like, he's just a crazy hobo cult leader. He was just a really charismatic homeless dude who, like, spoke in riddles, and people were like, oh, that's so wise. And he was controversial, and he, like, attracted a following. And, like, I don't know. I, I just really don't see much to admire there. Like, what's there to admire about someone saying give to the poor? Just fucking give to the poor. There's no <laughs> there. There's nothing wonderful there. Um, yeah. So yeah, you have to I, question the culture of the day when that's a profound thought, right? I mean, it, it, and it does. It speaks maybe to how primitive we we are have been in the past, and how you know you, you read Greek philosophy, you read you know Taoist thought, Buddhist thought, you know yeah. Jesus. They're not far apart in this kind of six seven hundred year window, yeah. and they all revolutionize their cultures for you know and and elevate them in their love and their compassion and their empathy. And you're like, okay, yes, great, then. But that was around the time people were like still burning their kids. So they had a good crop that year. You know what I mean? Like, it's not that hard to move up from that, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the could we say that today we might be moving further on even still? Maybe it is possible to do some of these things without some of the weird, crazy, toxic, homophobe, transphobe, sexist, you know, whatever, right? Yeah. I mean, the list is long, long, long list. Like, it's yeah. it's really hard. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, totally. it, through that lens, I can appreciate and find some measure of respect for what Jesus, assuming there was really a dude named Jesus, I think it's likely there were many characters that became embodied in this one figure throughout these historical books, if he existed at all. But let's just say that the Jesus of the Bible really did exist. I think through that, through the lens that you just brought up of, you know, where was the bar set that what he was saying was so revolutionary, where he's mm-hmm. saying to love your neighbors yourself, you know, like, it's like, well, that definitely predates Jesus, first of all, but so he's just reiterating something else he heard from somewhere, um, or just tapping into good old human wisdom, like, don't hurt people, because it hurts you, you know, like, there's some basic, some basics yeah. there, um, but I can appreciate what he symbolized for the time, um, however, I still have a hard time in this day and age with um, certain aspects of progressive Christianity that, you know, mm 
love, still love Jesus, it's like, it's still a little confusing to me because I'm, I'm like, Jesus didn't invent love, guys. It's really, it might've right. been groundbreaking to say this back then. There is nothing groundbreaking or like worship worthy about these things now. You know, mm. these, these exist in abundance, especially in my experience, in abundance outside of faith. Yeah. They're, they're here. They're as old as we are. Things like love, forgiveness, compassion, support, empathy, anything good that the Bible or any religion has to say was said by humans first, you know, and like, I, I understand there's faith there. People think that, you know, these words are divinely inspired. So it is coming from God. And I was one of them. I get it. I both get it and sure. don't get it at the same time. Do you ever find that? We're like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and these cultures, I mean, of course, these people thousands of years ago, humans creating a better world and, and coming up with these amazing ideas. Of course, they ground all this in the framework of like the gods are speaking through this person. You know, yeah. this is a prophet. This is a, because there was only that framework. Right. But as yeah. we move forward and as we develop and we start to look, is it possible we can look at someone that goes, Hey, I've got a really good idea. How about we do this and we could solve homelessness. And you go, Oh fuck, that's a great idea. Let's do what Steve said. Right. And we don't have to make Steve God. We don't have to make Steve a prophet. We don't have to go to the church of Steve now. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, is that possible? And, and I think the answer is quite obviously yes at this point. Like, we are moving forward. We are finding ways to frame uh, reality and, and create a, a meaningful um, outlook and, and, and a framework of purpose and meaning. And, and, you know, some people might call that spirituality on some level without needing a god or or unknown mystery you can still have some sort of spirituality as a way to orientate yourself in the world um is that possible without religion is it possible without these things of course i think it's very hard to argue it's not very hard for the fundamental like to them there is no other way than god's way or the highway um but yeah it's 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 really it's hard it's hard to see and and i think you do we talked about this last uh, time when we talked about, you know, is there any value in, in religion still? And, and we talked about, you know, things like progressive Christianity and how I think a lot of the times when we come out of these fundamental faiths, we might have rejected certain frameworks, but we generally speaking are still quite fundamental in the way we see the world. We still are looking for quite hard black and white ways to orientate ourselves. We're looking for an in and an out. We're looking for a right and a wrong and yeah. something like progressive Christianity, something like, Buddhism or Taoism can give us something where we go, oh, so this is good and this is bad. If I meditate five times a day, then I'm, I'll am i be in and I won't be out. Or if I join the progressive church. And so I still think that God's, he thinks we're all good and he made us perfectly, but there's kind of some of this weird sinful stuff. So he had to kill us some, but it's fine because he's still loving and it's good. But we are pro Black Lives Matter and we let gay people come to our church and be pastors. So I'm like, wow, that's a big step forward. Great. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's sad that a big step forward is, you know, treating black people and gay people as humans. Um, it's also, awesome. Right. You know, it's, it's like, it, 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 but it's, it's a step forward. And so I'm like, it's wonderful. I can celebrate people moving forward, but it does feel like other people, uh, that people are just, moving from one fundamentalism into another a lot of the time there still is quite an in and out dividing line there still is a very strong um black and white like this is the way to believe and if you don't believe like that even if we accept you we kind of pity you we, we want you to believe our way really um yeah. that's a that's a hard thing to navigate uh, but I, you know what i i know atheists that can be just as fundamental sometimes as well and, and be quite fundamental about rejecting other people and other spiritualities and so it's it's a hard one that I, I think it's it's a lesson for all of us to kind of navigate and learn for sure oh totally i completely agree like i'm i'm so keenly aware of where i still have fundamentalist hardwiring whether i would have grown up in religion or not i will mm -hmm. i do wonder how much of me just is this just my wiring where I tend to like things to be a little bit more compartmental? Oh, INTJ, right? I mean, like, <laughs> sign me up. Clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's very much that in me. And also, because of my background, I do try to be extra aware of, like, second-guessing myself. But even that feels like where I don't want to be too fundamentalist, fundamentalist but even that feels dangerous because I wonder, mm. am I self-gaslighting myself again? Or is yeah. this really how I feel? Because this is something that's true to me. 
like it, there's still that those brain, those neural patterns that I go back to of like, um, don't want to be fundamentalist about it. Um, but I don't know any other way to be. Oh no, but must be better. Must think different. Oh, is this what? Oh, but that doesn't feel. You know, there, there's still that mental wrestling that happens for me anyway, even outside of faith. That I've just learned to um, laugh and love at, you know, and know that like I'm no longer scared of hell. So that's mm. really nice. That takes a lot of the angst yeah. out. Of um, and then also one thing that I I was I was having a conversation recently with a woman who grew up a, in, in a Hasidic sect of ultra-Orthodox Judaism. And she was expressing that she and her husband, when they left, landed with a more like um, progressive Judaism thing. And she offered an insight to me because I, I shared with her, I was like, oh, you know, it really confuses me, you know, how some people like, to me, it's still like the religion is still the same textbooks. Like, how do you just throw away your old teachings about them, but still be looking at this book, you know, like how do you just focus on different verses? You know, I'm, I'm still confused by it. Progressive religion, whether it's Islam, Christianity, whatever. And she said that, um, she goes, you know what? I think it gives people a soft place to land. Mm. And that really made sense to me and helped me begin to understand where like, they're so scared of leaving it all entirely that if they can take the softer expression of the faith, then at least they can feel like it's a baby step. And maybe maybe they'll never move beyond that step, but at least it's out of the other step that felt more harmful sure. to them. And so I could that helped me a, a little bit. You know, again, for me, because I I do, I don't, I never had any connection to the source. So for me, all I had was the text, all I had was the Bible and what authority figures were telling me. Um I was just so hung up. I, I, it would have been impossible for me, I think, to have been a progressive Christian because it's like, we're still taking sermons based off from the same book though, guys. Like, is the Bible not true? Is that what it means to be a progressive Christian? Is the Bible's not the inerrant word of God? Oh, it is, but we're just focusing on the loving parts and the other parts are like open to interpretation or for the time and place. You know, like there's all, I, I'm so, so glad that I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> you know, the best part about being an atheist is I no longer have to be confused by that, that um, religious doctrine anymore because, and yeah. cherry pick and feel bad for cherry picking. And, you know, like, I, I don't know, for people who maybe do feel God or feel led by the spirit or whatever it is, it must be such a different experience for them. Such yeah. a different experience that I can't, I honestly can't even imagine how differently I might have been then and would be now had I actually experienced whatever it is that people are calling God. Yeah. I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really interesting. So we're doing research on people that are deconstructing faith and how that pans out. We're going to be doing it over about 10, 15 years, hopefully, and trying to sort of map out and navigate kind of the process. Um, and it's really interesting because anecdotally, having worked with people for about 10 years and, and certain people I've talked to for the full 10 years, I'm still close to them, I'm friends with them. Um, it's really interesting following people's paths. And one of the things I've noticed again and again and again is there's kind of two different types of people, it seems, overall. I'm going to drop very broad strokes. But generally speaking, you have the person that you're describing, someone that's very fundamental and the wind gets taken out of their sails the there is no more ground they've been pulling the threads and before they lock, look down the whole rug is gone and there's just no floor and they're like shit okay i'm falling um and they need a soft landing they need something that that is like okay i kind of feel safe i kind of feel a bit secure i still have a bit of fundamentalism but it's less fundamental it's softer it's a move in the direction and 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 it is generally speaking this kind of shift away from um, fundamentalism through um, maybe different faiths. People go from Christianity to, po uh, you know, maybe a, a, a progressive Christianity, and then maybe they even start exploring like Eastern uh, spirituality or maybe indigenous spirituality if they, you know, have um, a different kind of uh, background that they can explore and things like that. Um, and and often, not always, many people stop along the way and go, oh, I'm good. This, this works for me. It's good for me. It's good for my kids. For now and then we'll see how they go um, but you know it, it works it's a move forward and i'm and i look at it as a humanity and i'm like we're moving forward that's steps in the right direction if i if, stop looking at one person and go they have to get to the end because god knows where the end is right i mean god knows but thousands of years from now 
where are we, we're not even going to be having these conversations. We'll have gone forward to such degrees. We'll be asking totally different questions, right? Um, but a lot of those people keep moving forwards and they keep unraveling spirituality, faith, religion, and many of them end up agnostic, if not quite firmly atheist. Um, but what's interesting is there's different types of people um, that don't do that. They, they do just go, I'm done. I'm atheist. Boom. And it's just good night. I'm done. It's, it's over. Um, and it's a really fascinating thing to see those two different dynamics. But one of the things that's interesting is for some of those people that go, I'm done, I'm atheist, they don't stay like that. Some of them end up going 10 years down the line, go, I'm going to explore some faiths now that I I had to be done. I had to just walk away. But now I'm going, well, I could like reevaluate some of these things. And, and that's not that common. It just is some people within that second group do that. And I'm always intrigued by that and what draws people into that. And one of the things that I'm fascinated about that seems to be the type of person that's drawn by it are charismatics. Charismatics and Pentecostal people, they seem to have something in them that when they flip hard and go into atheism, there's this nagging thing of the experiences and the 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 things that they felt and, 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 and went through that I don't have to the same degree. I don't have that. I, I was in that world, but I don't have that to the same degree. I've seen some shit. I, I, I've seen some healing stuff. Like there's plenty of healings that I'm like, okay, I can do that. It's a party parlor trick. You give me 10 people in a room and I'll heal one of them this way, like heal. Um, but I've seen some stuff where I'm like, uh, I don't know. I'm sure at one point science will explain this, but I also am pretty sure it's probably not going to be in the next few months because it's <laughs> some fucking shit right there. Like, you know, I, I've had those things that, that they, they mess with my head as well. And they do draw me into going, what is going on behind the scenes? Is this quantum entanglement? Is this something that, you know, but, or is it aliens? I don't even know. Um, I might not attribute it to God, but I don't know what well, it is. Um, that you've come up with from like alternative. It's yeah. fascinating, right? I mean, it, it really is. But but the point being that there are those charismatics and you and I probably know those people that that they weren't playing, not playing, pretending, faking. They were going down. Someone laid hands on them and they fell over. And they um, they were healed of serious in, injuries or, or issues or whatever. And some of them you can go, I, I don't know, you mentioned your dad's injury and you're like, ah, I could probably come up with a good explanation for that. I One of the things I saw was mess with my head forever is i saw a man that was born blind and he was 82 and he didn't even have a pupil or an iris it's just a white eye um mm. i saw him start to see and he explained and he was describing things and his wife fell to the floor like eight year old woman just falls on the floor wailing wailing because she couldn't believe that her husband could see and i'm like fuck I, I i'm a believer right i every time i think back to that time i'm like okay, God, there is a God. I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. Absolutely. hundred percent believe in God, because what do I do with that one? I don't know. Um, and yeah, I'm sure there are other explanations for that. I'm sure there are other, and I tell you what, if it was a God, why is it my God? Right. Which, which God was it? Right. Because it's always my God. That's the God, right. It's, it's always my group's God. Um, but I'm, I'm so intrigued by people that, that have those experiences and how they navigate things because, I think it is especially hard for people trying to create that story um, and and the stories evolve and they change and they, they morph and, and that makes it hard as well. And um, yeah, it's, it's a weird one. It's a really, really weird thing to navigate. And, and I don't know, I mean, you work with people that are on these journeys too, and, and, and I'm sure you have anecdotally seen certain trajectories that people move on and, and go on. Um, but I think a big part of it is, like you said, that, that people looking for that soft landing is a huge one really huge so well, and another aspect that the woman who said that to me brought up was it also allows them at least for her community to still have some relationship with her family because it it's like she didn't leave it all you know she's at least still jewish you know mm. but like i don't know and i'd imagine for christians some of that's the same way too you know like maybe they left this denomination but they're still christians you know they're just radical <laughs> um yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, I i can definitely i'm learning and i'm so glad to be <laughs> starting to learn because it really honestly does confuse me not in a way that i want to be either it's like i'm, I'm i'd like to understand and even though yes i work in the similar space as you you've been doing this far longer and you talk to people mm. like me you know you, you talk to people so much more than i do in real back and forth dialogue most of my 
talking with people is either people that I know in real life, like friends who also grew up similarly or um, online, like through like text or DMs, you know, there's a lot of that, but you, you have a wealth bank of data and research from personal conversations with people that I, I don't have a fraction of. So you, you seeing, um, these patterns, like I, I can total, I, and also you being an ITJ, I can totally trust that you, you, you dealt <laughs> a lot and, 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 and recognized a lot of these patterns and systems. And so, yeah, like, I think, I think I am, I think for a long time, honestly, I think for a long time, progressive Christianity felt very threatening to me still, because it was like, it, there was a part of me that feared maybe they were right, but part of the Bible was wrong. But the part about Jesus being the son of God and the way to heaven is right. I think that's why I, I steered clear of that for a long time too, was because yeah. it, for, for someone to call themselves a Christian to any definition or anyone that I've talked to means that they believe that Jesus is the son of God who died for our sins, implying that we sin. That type of person for me for a long time is just not a safe person. If you believe right. in sin, you're not, I can't be safe around you because mm -hmm. sin is so subjective. To this Christian, this is a sin. To you, maybe this is a sin. And I'm just so tired and, and I never want to feel sin again. I never want to feel yeah. sin again. And so that's why even progressive Christianity still, it's like as, as open as I've known it to be. And I have good, dear friends who, who would identify as progressive Christian. Sure. Um, as open and loving and accepting as I know them to be, there's always that little inkling inside that's like, like, oh man, like, do you think I'm going to hell? Do you, mm -hmm. do you, there, do you, why is this, why is this okay? Why have you never read your Bible? Like, how can I, we're, are we even speaking the same language? Like, what does Christian mean to you? Like, there's still, it triggers the confusion for me. I'm mm -hmm. so tired of feeling confused yeah. about these things. So yeah. I think for a very long time, I steered clear of it for those reasons. But I feel like I'm in a pretty um, increasingly secure place to begin to ask these questions without feeling so threatened by what I might find. Um, yeah. And, and it feels really good to be getting there uh, and to feel more tolerant because I hated that I felt so intolerant. Um, the, the whole, and as a Christian too, like, like judging myself for being judgmental. Um, mm. I still feel like that a lot, like, but it's, I've learned to accept that um, I've gone through some religious trauma. It's okay that I have triggers and sensitivities. It's okay that I don't want to hear the word God, that I don't like progressive Christianity. It's okay that I don't, like, I've learned to have compassion for myself and where I'm yeah. at. Um, and that's, you know, it's it, it's still hard, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say, this, this is a big thing that we overlook as well, is religious trauma is a thing. And a huge portion of people have some form of adverse religious experiences right through to religious trauma itself and that has to be managed you have to be aware of what's your body's response to this what's going on you know oh i'm around someone that mentions the word god or sin and i am wrecked for hours yeah. when i get home and I, I i'm not even able to sleep i'm wired or i all i can do is sleep because i just don't have any energy left or whatever right i mean it's like huh what's going on here and is it safe for me to be around that of yeah. course if that's the case it's like you know what probably not going to explore progressive christianity this week right i mean it's like duh yeah. um, and i'm not saying that anyone who you know, works through their religious trauma should then go back and explore. I don't know if that's a good idea. Like you do yeah. you, do you know what I mean? Like people need to figure yeah. out what's helpful for them. But uh, I think that's a huge thing that's, that's going on. And I think that also speaks deeply to how people navigate. And I think it probably is more common for people that do have, I don't know if it is. I, I, I won't comment until I have the data. I, I, I'm too, I'm too honest to the data, but I do, I do wonder sometimes if it's more common for people to have those extreme um, just completely bailing on Christianity as hard as possible and just going, no, I'm out. Um, if that is um, somewhat of a healthy trauma response in some ways, but then I'm also aware of so many people that have trauma that in the midst of that trauma need to stay and, and hang on for so much longer than they should. And maybe it's a bit of both. Maybe they do that and then they have a severe out. I mean, I know that you probably 
um, hung on for longer than you. Looking back, you're like, there was probably points way before I kind of bailed that I should have bailed that I, I was done and I healthily probably should have got out. Um, yeah. And I think that's a common story as well. So it, it's so hard when we start incorporating things like religious trauma. Um, I really appreciate that you kind of had a, a section on that and you kind of mapped out some of um, Marlene Winnell's um, kind of helpful kind of points of, of coming through that and out that. And oh, gosh. yeah, it was, it's, it's huge. It was really like a lifesaver for me. And I don't feel like that's an exaggerating term to use because I think I, um, you know, it's it, discovering... Uh, Marlene Winnell's work and her book, Leaving the Fold. Like, so for anyone who doesn't know, she's the one who originated the term religious trauma syndrome um, back in like the early 90s, I think. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't find out about it until like the early 20 teens ish, like around sh shortly around there. Um, around 2012, I want to say, is when I found her work. And it really oh, allows me to be where I am today because it allowed me to make sense of my upbringing, of my experience after I left, which was like all, all the symptoms of trauma, the panic attacks, the self-harm, the triggers, the, um, like you say, you know, nights where you just can't sleep because someone said God, and it just activates all of this, what's wrong with me? Why was God never, God, are you, it, it just, it's a, it's a trigger thing, you know? And, and I feel like understanding, learning about religious trauma for me truly was, um, just life-savingly validating, and it really helped give me a map to begin moving forward to becoming a lot healthier and genuinely happier. And I don't know where I'd be today if I hadn't learned about that. Um, yeah. And I know there's a lot of discrepancy in the in the ex Christian, ex evangelical deconstructing space about religious trauma versus religious trauma syndrome. Um, I, I I'm I feel like I related so much to Dr. Winnell's work and she really helped me on a personal level that I could never negate um, or leave her out of this conversation sure. uh, because it's, it, it, yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, what, what is a syndrome? There's, you know, debate about that and, and can religious trauma be called that? You know, I don't know. I'd like to think maybe there can be both. Maybe mm -hmm. some people have adverse religious experiences or experience religious trauma. Maybe for some people, it does become a quantifiable set of ticking all the boxes to call it a syndrome. I don't know. Yeah. That's not for, I, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a psychologist. Yeah. I'll leave that to the experts. But I do know that um, it's, these are good problems, I think, to have because it means people are talking about it. It means people yeah, are getting out absolutely. Getting out one way or another. Whether they want to call it religious trauma or religious trauma syndrome, it makes me so happy. Um, that, yeah. that it's, that it's an argument to have, you know, because yeah. it means people are getting helped. <laughs> so yeah. that's something I think to be celebrated. <laughs> it's, it's huge. It's so exciting. It's one of the most talked about things I ever talk about in my podcast. I have people that are experts on it come on all the time. And, uh, I've tried to get Marlene to go on, but she's not keen. So, um, so love you. <laughs> um, but, uh, it's it's so exciting to see you know I, i'm good friends with um laura anderson and brian peck who are religious trauma institute but they've got a panel of of researchers that are working together and, and I'm, I'm in there with my work with the deconstruction network but there's dozens and dozens of researchers that are focusing their research specifically just on religious trauma right now. and i think at the end of the day like you said we can't ignore the work of someone like marlene Winnell, who is there at the ground right she's going holy crap this trauma stuff that's going on and complex PTSD and PTSD, like there's all these things going on. There's religious components to this. And there's something here where people have this for through religion and she's exploring it. She's writing about it. She's, she's pioneering this whole new yeah. branch of, of complex PTSD really. Um, and of course that's not going to be the end of the story in the same way that like no one's going, Oh, you go back and read Freud's work on psychology and you go, you're good. You don't have to read anything else. Of course not, but you can't, really study psychology without going back and picking up a book of Freud's and going, oh, I can see why, how he started a lot of these components. I know he's not the originator of psychology, but you know, such fundamental people along the way, she will always be one of those people, I think, um, regardless of whether um, people use her terminology and, and follow through on that. I think there's no doubt that her steps and her tools and things like that have been so helpful for so many that they'll forever be um, utilized and, and, and 
pulled upon. Um, and, it, and it's so exciting to see, you know, you walking through that map and, and reading through it. It's, it's just, uh, it made me so happy because I, I, I just, I, I went through this book and I just, I, I laughed, I cried, I, I, all the emotions the whole way through. And I just felt like, oh, I just love this, this little girl growing up in his home and she becomes a woman. And I'm just like, and, 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 and on some level completely disconnected it from the person I've talked to on the podcast or I've, I've DM'd on Instagram, like completely. And it's just this, this, and I'm, and I'm seeing her and I'm, I'm going, how's this going to pan out? And I know how this pans out. I've, I've talked to you. I, I follow you, you know, I know how it pans out, but I'm like, oh, I hope it goes okay. And, you know, and I'm, I'm in the, uh, that, that, uh, you know, apartment with you and you're banging your head against the wall and you're having these pants. Like, and I'm going, oh my God, God, no, Alice, I hope it's all going to be okay. You need to get help or whatever. You know, it's, it, it's such a, um, uh, a powerful story that you're sharing and, um, and it's and it's one that so many people can resonate with that that, that can navigate and and uh, and and look at and go yeah I, I I've been through so many of these components and and I think the ability to show hope in it and and what I love as well is showing hope in some really unconventional ways as well you know a lot of people I speak to. Um, on this podcast do hold to some form of spirituality, whether it's a very whack a doodle like you know very out there airy fairy thing that's usually me right i'm like you know what i've taken too many psychedelics to say that there's not more to consciousness than my brain but i don't know what that is right that, that is me i'm weird and i don't know what you put a pin in to say that's what phil is and then i've talked to progressive christians and i've talked to um zen buddhists and, and people all over the place and they all have a beautiful perspective but what i loved reading towards the end of your book is you managed to create a beautiful perspective through the lenses of pessimism and nihilism. You managed to give me the seven deadly sins as a to-do list. And I was like, yes. And I, I, I just, I'd, I'd love if you could share, we'll, we'll wrap up here as well, because I know we've been going on for a while and I want you to still enjoy your day. Um, but, I want you to be able to go to bed and get some sleep. <laughs> I know, but I'm, I'm probably going to be up for another hour after this anyway, trying to like, I'm too amped now. I get so excited yeah. about these conversations. Um, <laughs> but I'd love for you to share. I mean, are, do you still see yourself through that nihilistic, pessimistic lens? Are you still quite a nihilistic, pessimistic person? Have you have you grown out of that phase? I mean, people will want to say that, right? Well, it's just a phase that you're in. But the way you describe those things, and I'd love for you to kind of talk about how you you frame the world in those lenses. It made me, I'm, I'm very nihilistic and I'm quite pessimistic. I'm uh, quite as an understatement. I'm very pessimistic. I don't know if that's an <laughs> INTJ thing. I don't know if that's what it is, but I am it. I, I, I do not not have a lens of optimism and I work so hard to be more optimistic and more encouraging and more hopeful and whatever, but it's, it's hard work for me. Um, and so you, I, I love the way you framed those things. I don't know if you could maybe talk about how you navigate it because that's a hard thing. It's not something we teach in Christianity. You don't go to Sunday school and go, all right, kids, this is how you're going to be saved through nihilism. This is how you're going to be redeemed by being pessimistic. How, how did that work for you? And, and, you know, what is your relationship with, with those kind of personality traits or outlooks today? Yeah. Um, well, firstly, I'm, I'm, it makes me really happy that that part of the book, like, uh, that you could appreciate that. I think, um, uh, so for, for me, I do still very much, um, nihilism and pessimism are still two of my most favorite treasured lenses with which to view life because, uh, let's look at the reverse of those. I find it easier to explain how I ended up with those two lenses when I kind of look at what the opposites were, which to me, faith embodies beautifully. Um, to me, faith felt synonymous with optimism, which to me, optimism feels like denial. It's hope for what is not. Mm -hmm. it's, it's faith that things will be better than what they are now. And that feels very dangerous to me. Um, you know, there's like positive thinking, reframing, um, all of these like psychological terms. I don't necessarily mean to say that they're bad at all, but they were not helpful to me. When I would try them on, it felt so familiar. It felt like denial. Again, it felt like that self gaslighting again of, um, you know, like, well, like this sucks right now. This hurts, but let's think positively about it that mentality felt like lying to myself again. Mm. Last thing I ever want to do in my life is lie to myself again. Um, because that, 
the cost was so high and I never want to pay that price again. Um, I would much rather live in a state of like always expecting the worst because when I do that, life is full of so many wonderful surprises. When you're always mentally prepared for like, you know, love is going to hurt. It makes all of love's wonderfulness like, ah, just like a constant hit kind of, of um, happiness and joy as it does for me. I understand mm. that this little kit, these lenses will not be helpful to everyone. And so I'm not trying to like recommend them. I, I am just trying to share my truth, which was that I was just startled to find that um, when I refused to lie to myself anymore, th that took away the idea that there was any reason for life that I would ever be able to understand. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's a reason for life. I don't think life has any sort of meaning. I really don't, but that's what makes it kind of cool is, is it takes me to a happy place of like, wow, like what a random accident that we just were here. There's no point to it. And how lucky did I get? Now those other people, uh, it wrecks me that they didn't get lucky. Um, there's so many people in, in the world and throughout time that I, I feel like the idea that there's no meaning for it is so much more of a comfort to me when I observe human suffering than the idea that there's a reason for their suffering. That feels unspeakably cruel to me, mm. no matter what that reason is. And the most common one, even among secular folk that I've found, maybe not strictly secular in an atheistic sense, but even in the non-religious or spiritual world is like, oh, well, there has to be bad for there to be good. When did we accept that? Why is that true? Why does there have to be bad for there to be good? And people talk about polarity and little opposites. And it's like, I don't know, maybe there's something to that, but that, that way of thinking brings up a lot of, um, it, it feels harmful to me. It feels toxic. It feels, it, it feels so, I, I don't have words to describe how disturbed it makes me that people think that other entire countries like Yemen need to starve to death so that we can know what satiation feels like. Cause that's what it feels like they're saying um, is that people need to be starving in Yemen right now. So we can appreciate that we have such a bounty of food. That's what I hear when people say there needs to be bad for there to be good. And that is just utterly heartless in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I can't wrap my mind around that. And if anything beyond the obvious, cause I, again, I know this about myself that I can, you know, draw lines where people don't mean for there to be any. And I look at things a little literally, it's like, I don't know what sort of metaphysical, there, there would have to be just be more metaphysical reasons that they're alluding to that I just don't have time to entertain. I'm here now. This is what makes me feel good. This is what inspires me to actually help people, not just dismiss their suffering under the mm -hmm. blanket statement of um, it needed to be here so we could know what good was. Uh, I, I just find that appalling. I can't <laughs> emphasize it enough. Um, and so for me, the idea that there is no reason for why people in Yemen are starving to death right now, other than what's going on here in the world. It's, there's like a war with Saudi Arabia. There's the U.S. Flying, or there's so many ways that are, there's so many things contributing. Yeah. I'm just using Yemen as an example, obviously, to just try to lash this onto something. Sure. I mean, it's a great yeah. example of some um, terrible stuff. <laughs> I, I think that uh, when I look at just cause and effect on a real life physical worldly scale, then I start to see um, potential solutions. When I don't think that there's a bigger reason for things, it inspires me to take action. It motivates me to do better. The idea that there's like a reason for life and life is meaningful does not inspire me to want to be a better person. It makes me feel mm. awful. It makes me feel trapped. It makes me feel confused. It makes me feel angry. That lens that there, that life is meaningful just doesn't serve me. That's just the bottom line of it. And the idea that life is meaningless serves me so much more. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and uh, so that's nihilism and pessimism. I think they're, I think they're close friends, you know, like I, I don't think the world will ever be at peace. I don't, there's zero evidence to think that um, <laughs> from where I sit. And yeah, I don't know everything. Well, and Alice, you've got to look back to 6,000 years ago to the garden, you know? Right? <laughs> oh God, yeah, before the sin. Um, no, I just, I just think that as long as there's existence, there will be suffering. And uh, I think that 
um, for me, again, just bring it back home to myself. Like when I try to look for the positives, I feel more often confronted on the daily by the negatives. When I look for mm. goodness, I more readily see evil and hurt. When I look for evil and hurt, I more readily see goodness. So it's like a reverse psychology thing, I guess, maybe. But um, it works for me. It yeah. feels safe to me. It feels true to me. Um, it, I'm a lot less disappointed, which means I'm a lot less hurt, which means I'm a lot less angry, which means I'm less depressed. Um, I've read one definition of depression that's it's anger turned inward. And that really resonated with me. I'm sure people wind up in places of depression for all different reasons. So I don't need to be making blanket statements about this, um, but just what these words mean to me. Yeah, that made a lot of sense. And if anger is depression turned inward for me, what makes me angry, hope, faith, those piss me off like nothing else. Mm. And so they don't, they don't serve me. Um, and I can see how they can serve a lot of people. Maybe that's all they have. Maybe I'm so privileged that I haven't needed to have hope or faith from a, pl a place of desperation. Like maybe someone in Yemen does. I don't know. Sure. I've, I've once had someone essentially, I was working in a, I was volunteering in a third world country and the organizer who was there, he was a local, very Christian man. He very kindly said to me something along the lines of that I was rich enough to not need faith anymore. Um, and it really stuck with me. And I was like, you know, mm. I think maybe I am like, I'm, I'm privileged enough that I don't need faith. Um, I don't know for, for whatever reason it always stuck with me what he said. And, and, you know, there's lots of ways I can analyze it. Maybe that sounds douchey. I don't know, but like, I, all I know is faith did not work for me. Hope did not work for me. Yeah. Love, is not God. And, um, I'm just a lot happier and at peace and I feel a lot truer and safer inside my own skin when life is just an accidental than the idea that there's any reason for anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a beautiful way to see things. I, and obviously a lot of people go, no, it's not. And that's okay as well. <laughs> that's totally fine. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm very, I'm very uh, pessimistic. So I, I really resonated with the words on the page just leapt at me. And I was like, oh, this is, this is beautiful. This is, this is powerful. This is, this is, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sounding like a Christian pastor with all my beautiful, powerful, like, you know, whatever <laughs> adverbs or adjectives mm. or whatever. But um, uh, yeah, I just, I just think it's, it's evidence further that we need to find meaning. We create our own meaning, right? Christians create their own meaning. Jews create their own meaning. Buddhists, atheists, we're all creating our own meaning. We're all finding something that works for where we're at right now, our psychology as it's developed today to where we are. Um, and like you said, maybe you're in a dire strait, in a, in a harder situation. Maybe it's poverty. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's um, lack of relationships or, or uh, too many relationships or whatever. Um, and something like faith brings you healing. It brings you peace. You know, for every person that is traumatized by hell, another person's trauma is healed by hell yeah. and heaven right you know because i lost my grandma and actually the idea of an afterlife and a heaven and a hell well i know she was a christian so that brings me peace and yeah. then the person standing next to me just goes no actually i can't sleep at night because i was taught about the afterlife right and yeah. what, what do you do with that right what, what do yeah. you do because apparently this belief isn't inherently traumatic to every person and it isn't inherently damaging yeah. necessarily to every person some people will go cradle to the grave and then go off to heaven obviously um believing and it worked for them the whole time it never did particularly harm them uh maybe because they weren't as intense as you and me as well and they weren't <laughs> constantly paranoid they'd go there um yeah. they were constantly on the teetering edge of being disapproving by god and kicked out um but yeah alice thank you so much um we, we've rambled on a lot and i, I loved every <laughs> second of it I, I love chatting with you it's always a real privilege to have you on and everyone needs to buy your book honestly I'm, maybe not everyone maybe there's some people that won't enjoy it or it'll be somehow yeah. painful or broke break them but honestly especially if you grew up charismatic pentecostal in that world um especially if what we're talking about resonates with you if people are here still two hours in they've probably already bought the book on their phone on amazon or something <laughs> anyway don't go to amazon go to a local bookstore um and uh yeah how can people connect with what you're doing you know plug into uh, you're doing amazing work with dare to doubt um how can people kind of connect with you and what you're doing and follow what you're doing 
So um, it, on Instagram, only on Instagram and Twitter right now. And with Dare to Doubt, it's just at Dare to Doubt. Um, and that's where you'll find the stuff I share related to everything we're talking about here. Um, on my personal account on Instagram, I'm just at Alice Gretchen, just my name. Um, and then on Twitter, Alice Food. Um, I'm less and less on Twitter these days. Instagram is more where I find my social media energy going. Um, so there. Uh, yeah, and then also um, just alicegretchen.com. There's a website. Uh, like I said, my audio book will be coming out pretty soon for those who prefer audio books. And um, I'll definitely make it available on my website there. I'm still trying to figure out what distribution things. And actually, mm. as much as I love supporting your local bookstores, my book is print on demand. So it's at, it's not oh. in hard copy bookstores, um, but at right now. So uh, but yeah, it's, right. it's everyone grudgingly go to Amazon and give more money to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> there's other online sites that, that, uh, no, I know. From, but yeah, I, there's, there's some great options out there. Do your research people be, be responsible. <laughs> and Phil, thank you so much for having me on again. This was such a, oh, of course. Such a fun discussion and like, I really appreciate, um, it's, it's, it's so interesting to me hearing what parts of the book spoke to you and your questions. Like I, I really, I really particularly enjoyed it. So thank you. Thank you so very much. Oh, of course. <laughs> Anytime, honestly, it's, it's always a joy to chat and you're such a fascinating, interesting person with such a phenomenal past. I'm sure that you would uh, give up a good chunk of some of your past, maybe if you give it a choice or maybe not, maybe that is who, who we are and, and what makes us who we are and all that we it's love. But we are who we are we are absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely all right well alice i hope you have a good day I'll, I'll let you know when this comes out it'll probably be the next couple of weeks or so um but okay. I'll, I'll shoot your message when it comes out and be sure to tag you and everything but yeah all right, all right. thanks Bill. have a good rest you catch you later bye right. bye <laughs> If you are deconstructing, there is no reason to do this alone. It can be an incredibly lonely process, but the deconstructionnetwork.com is a free resource to help you find others deconstructing in your local area. If you would like to support what I do, everything I do is for free from talking to people for hours on end to producing resources and podcasts. Um, it is only possible because people give uh, generously. There's never any need to give. Um, it will always be free, everything I do. But if you do, we do have an amazing private community group that we talk on over on Discord um, that you would gain access to. And we do regular audio and video chats on there as well. So it'd be great to see you in there. But of course, never any requirement. And of course, please, please, please come and talk to me on Instagram. I love connecting with people. I love helping people on their journey. If you need a safe space to process your deconstruction, I would love to connect. It's just at Phil Drysdale. Love every one of you. Peace.